You are all welcome to God's house uh, this morning. It's really a pleasure to have you all join us today. We're really thankful to God for how He's kept us uh, throughout the week and He has brought us to His house this morning to worship and to fellowship. I'll just go over a few notices as we begin. Uh, there's a flyer which we uh, brought out of our activities over this Advent period. Uh, we, uh, Gary will be going out this week and a few of us to you know, share this leaflet, to put it indoors. And if you are available and you're willing to <coughs> assist, uh, please uh, see Gary or myself after the service. Whatever time you have available during the week, if you can help out, that would be greatly appreciate it. Just see us so that we can confirm uh, day and time. And you can grab uh, one of the leaflets here uh, just to get uh, the information as far as what we are doing over this period. We have our evening service here at half past six this evening and Gary will be taking the service. You are welcome to join us again uh, to worship and to hear God's word. So we will start by uh, hearing from God's Word. I would like to call on Paul uh, to take the Bible reading for us this morning from Psalm 37. Yeah, reading from verses 12 to 22, Psalm 37. Come to the Lord's Word. Psalm 37, verse 12. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and the needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. The sword shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord, but the splendour of the meadows, shall vanish. Into smoke they shall vanish away. The wicked borrows, does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. For those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Paul. We will take our hymn books now and, and, and sing 641. The day thou gavest, Lord, is ended. Moses. Moses. That's enough for the music. That's very good. Okay. 641. Wait for the music. And then we'll stand to sing. The day thou gavest, Lord, is ended. Six, four, one.
before you this morning we bow before you because you are the most high God you are the one who is before time was you are the great I am you are the one who is who was and who is still to come you are God all by yourself You are not some idea of some clever or spiritual people. But you are the one whose idea is man. Lord, we thank you for the thought of our immortality that we have through you to live forever and even in light of that we understand that in this place called earth where we find ourselves in this space of time, Lord. We are frail creatures of dust. We have been subject to mortality. But you are the one who, when heaven and earth passes away, you are still God. And we have the hope of dwelling forever and ever in your house through what you accomplish for us. Lord, we are here not on our, on our own merit, not our, on our own credit, not because of our righteousness, which is as filthy rags. We are here because of who you are, because you bid us to come. Because we have an, an acceptance in your sight because of your son. We have an audience before you through 
our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we acknowledge that we did not bring ourselves here. It is because of your mercies that we are not consumed. The many who went to sleep last night they did not wake up this morning. But here we are in your house, which is called by your name. We thank you for your spirit that is at work in the earth today. Carrying out your purposes. Bringing men, women and children to your house. Drawing them to yourself. Convicting the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. And we thank you because we have hope in you, Lord. We turn to you this morning. Praying that you have mercy on us. Father, forgive us for our sins, for our failures, for our shortcomings. Where we go astray, in our minds, in our thoughts, words, attitudes and actions. Lord, forgive us of our sins, of commission and omission. Pray that we be washed afresh in the precious blood of Jesus. Pray that your spirit will move powerfully upon us. We pray that you stir up your gifts in us, fan into flames, zeal, and fresh passion for your name. Lord, we commit today's service into your hands, asking for your special blessing. Lord, we've come out of our poverty. We've come out of our weaknesses, out of our blindness, out of our failures. But you are more than not enough to meet us. At the point of our needs. You are the all sufficient one. El shall die. Lord meet us. Let every man, woman, boy, girl know your touch upon their lives. Even now. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are struggling with health issues. Remember Jill McCarthy. Remember Alistair. Lord have mercy. Lord, you know our needs, you know where we struggle. Lord, we pray that you minister grace, minister health to our bodies. Keep our minds in perfect peace, focused on Jesus. Strengthen us in the faith, Lord. And let us know that blessed promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Your presence is ever near us. Now we're praying for the saving of those that we know in our homes, in our families, both immediate and extended. Have mercy on them. It is a great need for us to be saved. That is why you came into the world. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. We pray that by your Spirit, you move upon your hearts. Lord, even in the midst of the rejection of the gospel, even in the midst of the unbelief, Lord, you are walking. We're reminded of Paul in that city, in that wicked city, in that unbelieving city. And you said to him that you have many people in that city. And there are many people you have in this city, in our families, in this nation, who are not yet saved, but it is your will that they come to that saving knowledge of us. And Lord, we pray for them. Lord, we plead and intercede for, the, for them. Bring them into the fold, O oh God, according to your perfect wisdom and timing. Cause them to eat this wonderful fruit of salvation, which we are partaking of even now. Lord, remember this city where we find ourselves. Lord, bless the ministration of your word in this city through your faithful churches. Strengthen them, encourage them. Add more people to the fold, as many as are being saved. You said you will build your church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Lord, let the church arise triumphant. Cause us to be on the forefront of what you are doing in these times. Cause us to be faithful. Help us not to be despondent and discouraged. So Lord, 
We ask that you lead us on. Thank you because your strength is made, it made perfect in our weaknesses. Oh, we are only a handful of people. But we serve a great and mighty God. Who is alive and well. And who is still at work. Even in the midst of a nation. That is forsaking him so fast. Lord, use us as you see fit, Lord, for your glory. Use our prayers and all that we bring to you, which you've given us. Lord, use it, Lord. Cause a revival, cause an awakening, a turning of the hearts of the people back to you, Lord. Let this nation return to righteousness. We pray for your glory. Have mercy, we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to call on Adrian to please kindly take the children's talk for us. Thank you. Well, good morning, young people. It's good to see you. Are you okay over there, or would you like the children to come and sit here? Are they okay there? That's okay. That's okay. Don't worry. Okay. It's a real blessing to see so many children in the, in the house of the Lord, isn't it? As an encouragement to us all. Now, okay. I'm going to look into my Mary Poppins bag. Now, do you have one of these at home? I'm sure you do in another four days. You've got a watch? Yeah, we've got, we think we've all got watches. What are they for? What do we use watches and clocks for? Sorry? Show us and tell us the time, don't they? And I'm sure we all, we're all obedient to that, don't we? So, do you ever um, use a clock to know what time you have to get to school or to church? You do? That's an excellent answer because that means I can go on to my next question. Okay, so let's just pretend, let's just pretend this morning, okay, that you're getting ready for church in the morning. So what time do you have to leave to get to here on time? Say that again. Eight. Eight o'clock. You have to be up and ready, eight o'clock ready to get here. Okay, about eight o'clock? Oh, you're, you're up a lot earlier than I am then. I usually press the button and I turn over and go back to sleep for another hour. So, very good. Okay. So, okay, so what, uh, so what the clock says, do you know how to be ready? What things have you got to do in the morning to get ready before you come to church? What things have we got to do to get ready before we come to church in the morning? Um, dress up. You've got to get dressed? Devotional. You've got to do your devotional. Good lad. Very good. Any more? Come on, there's lots of things. Or am I the only one who has to get... Yeah? Brush your teeth. You've got to brush your teeth. Good lad. Yeah, have some breakfast. Do you have some breakfast? There's so many things that we've got to do, haven't we? Uh, before we get ready. All right, there's lots of stuff we have to do to be ready before we leave. All right? But what I want to just let us to concentrate on for our little lesson this morning, uh, young people, there's also something else that we need to get ready for. Okay, and I think we might learn a bit more about that today. And that's about Jesus' return. We've already read a little bit about that this morning and sung a little bit about that. But we have to be ready for Jesus' return. So, did you know that Jesus is going to come back to earth one day? Yes. Do we know that? Yeah, and he said that, isn't he? So what we're going to find out, I've just asked for some volunteers to read. So who has John chapter 14 and verse 3? Okay, can you just come and just read that verse for us? Nice and loudly so everyone can hear what John chapter 14 and verse 3 tells us. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Excellent. Jesus' very own word. So we all need to be ready for when he comes. Now the problem we've got with that is, okay, if I just turn these around, all right, 
when you can't see no time or clock, right? The problem we have is that we don't know what time he's going to be here, do we? We don't even know what day or what year he's coming back, do we? So we have to be really ready for when that happens. But what does God say about that? Okay, so now I need someone to read Matthew 24, verses 36, and then verse 42. So 36 goes first. For that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Okay, only the Father knows. So what does verse 42 tell us? So always be ready. You don't know the day your Lord will come. Okay. So there we are, there's a warning from Jesus. We've got to be really ready because we don't know when that's going to happen, do we? So about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So therefore, keep watch, it tells us, doesn't it? Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. So we're being told to be watchful, all right? So that means we have to be prepared and we have to be obedient. We live in a world that wants to take us away from Jesus, doesn't it? But we are told by Jesus to be obedient and to be ready and to be faithful. So, a story of being watchful. You know, I might be going to a meeting, I went to come to try and come to a meeting the other day, and I find I had plenty of time, and then suddenly I just sat down on my chair, I turned the telly on, I was watching football or a film or something, and then all of a sudden I looked at my watch and found I was running behind time. Now everything becomes a real rush, don't it? I'm sure I'm not the only one who does that. And uh, we get rushed, and then I get flustered, and then I arrive, and I'm not really prepared for what I've come for, really, sometimes. All right, that's what Jesus warns us against. So don't get taken by the world, because the world wants to take us away from being prepared and ready for Jesus. All right? So, Jesus wants us to be watchful, to stay focused on him, and to be prepared, and to be obedient to his word at all times. So we don't get caught out by the world around us. Now, because Jesus tells us that he will come at a time when we don't expect him, it will be a surprise. I don't know whether you've ever been to a surprise birthday or welcome for people. You know, they don't really know what's going on. And so that's what it's going to be like when Jesus comes. So we're supposed to be ready for him. That's what the word says. So someone's just going to quickly read out Matthew 24 and verse 40 and 41. So what does that tell us? Nice and loud. Okay, so what are the people doing in that particular reading? They're just doing their ordinary day things, aren't they? They're working, uh, they're, they're, they're working in somewhere like the factory or the fields or we'll be at school at our school desk and then all of a sudden we're doing ordinary things and Jesus will suddenly come and one of us will be there and one of us will be taken. All right? So we've got to be ready by doing the things that Jesus wants us to do so that we don't get caught out. So if we believe in him and doing the right things that he wants us to do, he will be happy with us. And that's really good news, isn't it? All right? So we don't have to know when Jesus is coming back, all right? But we have to be ready for him. So we have to be ready by keep believing in him and doing the right things that he wants us to do for him. All right? So if we believe that Jesus died on the cross and that we've repented of our sins, and we are obedient to his word with faith, he will be pleased with us. So we haven't got to worry about what time he's going to come because we'll be ready in our hearts and our minds and our souls. Isn't that encouraging, young people? Isn't that good news today? All right? Okay, so when he comes, we'll see him face to face because he's coming to judge the world for all the wrong and the evil and the horrible things that has done. All right? And we're going to be taken with him to heaven forevermore. All right? Now, I just want to finish with a story about uh, I, about myself, which was I was probably a little older than you, and my dad took me to a church, and there was this big Scottish minister, and he was talking about Christ's return, and he was talking about how Christ is going to come down on a cloud, a thunder and lightning, trumpets, and everything's going to happen, and I left that building terrified. I was really afraid. Okay, and, and uh, a few nights later, I was laying in my bed, and in the middle of the night, guess what happened? That was thundering, that was lightning, that felt like the house was moving. And so what I did, I got up and I ran into my mum and dad's bedroom to make sure they were still there. Because I was just afraid that they weren't going to be there. And I knew at that moment I had to do something with my life. So I don't want you to be afraid like that. So a few months later, my father took me to a mission in the town. And would you believe it, the preacher was talking about the same things. I knew at that point I had to do something about it. 
I had to have that assurance that Jesus was in my heart and I wasn't to be afraid. And I, and, I, and I committed my life to the Lord. So every time it thunders and lightens now, do you know what? I think, you know, the Lord's come to get me. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right? I'm no longer afraid. All right? And that's what we want you to be like, young people. So don't be afraid. All right? Jesus is coming. So if you do the right thing for Jesus, and you will be ready for him wherever you are, whatever you do. Amen? Amen. Shall we just say a prayer for the young people? All right? Father Jesus, we are looking forward to the time when you will come back again so that we can see you and we will be with you. We pray that you will help us to do the right things, that you will work, work for us to do that, so that we will be ready for whenever you come. Bless us, Lord, we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you, young people. Amen. Thank you very much, Adrian. Let's take our hymn books again. <coughs> I don't know why I left mine. And, and open to um, 673. We sing, There is a Redeemer. 673. We'll wait for the music to begin and we'll stand to sing. Sorry, Freddie. Freddie, just to mention as well, I have the mic. I have the mic as well. Thank you. So, 673, there is a Redeemer. <coughs> Christian basic series, we will be considering the subject 
of Christ's imminent return in judgment. This is what the Bible teaches, and this is part of what we believe here at Malden Road Chapel. This, this is one of the great doctrines of the church, that Jesus would come again, and the judgment of man is certain. I pray God helps us and gives us the grace as we look at this subject. Let us open our Bibles uh, to the book of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Following on from the account after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and his ascension. I read Acts chapter 1. Verses 1 down to 11. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Amen. Amen. I think it's the sovereignty and providence of God that we are looking at this subject again today, which we also looked at at our Bible studies this past uh, Thursday. And as we discussed uh, uh, there, many would have received the news this week that England is no longer a majority Christian country. One of the signs of the last days before Christ comes in judgment is that the wickedness of man would greatly increase. And what's also interesting is that as the data came out that the Christians are now a minority in England, they also released information that there is an increase in other religious, uh, occultic, and spiritual groups. What this means is that many are turning more to darkness. Paul, in his second uh, letter uh, to Timothy, which is uh, one of the last letters he wrote as he awaits, awaits execution in a Roman a prison, he mentions there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, reading from verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times, challenging times, times where it will be very difficult to be a Christian, these times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, 
boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. There is surely nothing new under the sun. That which is happening has already been. But how long do we think that this vicious and abominable cycle would continue before God puts an end to it and brings in everlasting righteousness and peace? Peter mentions in 2 Peter 3 that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since our ancestors died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly forget, Peter says, that by the word of God the heavens were created and the earth being formed out of water was surrounded by water and by the same waters. The world was flooded and destroyed. But the heavens and earth, which are now kept by the same word, are, pres- are reserved for fire unto the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, speaking to the Christians, the church, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The church has always been a minority. Noah in the midst of a wicked generation, Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. Joshua and Caleb among the twelve spies. Rahab and her family in Jericho. The Israelites who entered into the promised land. And the exiled Jews who returned from the Babylonian captivity to rebuild Jerusalem. The people of God have always been a remnant who found grace in the sight of God. In the midst of an ungodly majority. And what has been happening over the period of time has been a sifting process. In contemporary times, we think of the sexual revolution of the 60s, laws being passed in the favor of the mother of babies in the womb, the redefinition of marriage in our recent uh, time, and the blessing of this unholy matrimony in churches the reassigning of gender and the ordination of sexual perverts as church leaders, the celebration of sexual perversion, vile affections, Paul writes in Romans 1. And then he describes how their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature and the men living the natural use of the woman born in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful. So what scripture says. We we'll also have the persecution. Of all those who stand upon God's word. And preach the truth of the Bible. Against sin. You think about the wars. The killings of man's fellow man. Especially in the name of religion. You witness the hate. Greed. Immorality. Rebellion. The calling of evil good and good evil and so forth all these are on the forefront so that the true church can be distinguished John the Baptist mentioned about one coming who is mightier than him because he was before him who sandals John is not worthy to carry he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire John said And he went on to say his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. 
We're not just talking about the separation of the godly from wicked men. But also the separation from the true church, from the false church. We're talking about the judgment of God upon this fallen world. This wicked world and its system which is controlled by the prince of the power of the air. That is now at work in the children of disobedience. We know that we are children of God. John the Apostle writes. And that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. This is not a surprise. That is why we see the world moving in a direction that it is moving in. With accelerated speed. The devil is carrying out his works on the earth. And has blinded the minds of them who do not believe. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. John Bunyan, in his wisdom, reveals in the holy war how the enemy takes over man's soul through deception. And then equips man's soul with his armor to resist God. One of this armor is his breastplate of iron. Which represents a hard heart. A heart that is hard as iron. And past feeling like a stone. If you get and keep it, the enemy said, mercy shall not win you. And judgment will not frighten you. We touched on the ministry of the Holy Spirit last week. The Holy Spirit is God working on the earth today. God is still at work in the midst of of the wickedness that we witness today. Yet one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit, which is often neglected and overlooked in this church age, is the ministry of conviction. Jesus said in John 16, 8, concerning the coming of the Holy Spirit after he ascends to heaven. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in the Son of God. Concerning righteousness because the Son has gone back to the Father and we see Him no more. Which is evidence of Him being God's standard of righteousness. And God confirming this by His resurrection and ascension. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is already judged. And everyone who doesn't believe stands under this condemnation. Because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Light has come into the world and they love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. God's tender lamb who came and was offered as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. Dying so that God's people would be saved. Is coming again. Or this time as a terrible lion that will judge all those who reject him. How do we know that he is coming back again? Look at the words of the angel in Acts which we just read. From verse 10. And why the disciples they look steadfastly towards heaven. As Jesus is taken up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. It is a fact that the Lord Jesus is coming back. Jesus himself talked about his imminent return to his disciples in many accounts and the Gospels, one of which we we heard during the children's uh, talk from the Gospel of Matthew. We find another one there uh, in Matthew 16. And it is worth uh, noting that at the start start of that chapter, the religious leaders, they came testing Jesus, asking that he would show them a sign of, from heaven. And Jesus responds 
uh, calling them hypocrites, that they can look at the sky and know what the weather would be like. That they could, they could see that and, and know what's going to happen, but they could not discern the signs of the time. And then he goes on to call them a wicked and adulterous generation and concludes that no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. What is this sign of the prophet Jonah? It speaks about the death of Christ. That's what he explained when he first mentions it in Matthew 12, 40. He said, for as Jonah was in the belly of a great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth. He talks about the salvation that will come through the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. This is the time, the present time in God's redemptive history. And the coming of God's Son into the world truly marks the beginning of the last day. The last days. To use an illustration, it's like when God told Noah to build the ark. It is because the end of all flesh had come before him. And God was making a way of rescue. We see Hebrews uh, 1 quickly before we come back to Matthew uh, uh, 16. It mentions there that God in, at various times and in various ways. He spoke uh, in times past to the fathers by the ministry of the prophets. But in these last days has spoken to us by his son. When he sent his son into the world. You see what it says as well. In Hebrews 9, read from verse 24 of Hebrews 9. It says, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, talking about when he ascended, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the, holy, the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, aside from sin, having uh, not to do with sin, unto salvation. Saving them because of the wrath of God, because of the judgment of God. Which is coming upon the earth. It was A.W. Tozer who said that Jesus Christ is God's final word to humanity. And today if you will hear his voice. Do not harden your heart. You find in scripture. Like we see here in Hebrews 9. That there is a distinction. A distinction is made in light of Christ's return. He is coming in judgment. Yet we find that those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear again, not to deal with sin, but to save them, to rescue them. It was the same with John the Baptist, when we, uh, uh, which we referenced earlier, that uh, when Christ comes, he would gather his wheat into the barn. But will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So we clearly see a distinction. Just like in the narrative of Noah and the ark. Christ comes in judgment. His people are saved on one hand. And the world is judged. The gospel warning is going out to all. God's people and the world. Enter the ark which is Christ. Get saved. While you can. 
do not wait till the door is shut and then you start knocking for God to let you in it will be too late Christ's return is for the whole world but there will be two categories of people when he returns those who are his followers who eagerly await him as Hebrew 9 mentioned and those who are not we we'll focus on the first group at this point let's go back to Matthew 16 and see what it says from verse 24 then Jesus said to his disciples if anyone desires to come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me he is speaking to his disciples that's what it means to be a disciple it means to come after Jesus and to come after him means to deny yourself take up your cross daily and follow him it means to lose your life for Christ and his gospel's sake that's what it says there in verse 25 for who Ever desires to save his life would lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it it is better losing your life for Christ's sake than wasting it how do you waste your life it's what Jesus mentioned by trying to keep it eternal security is only found in the Son of God and His Gospel. Outside of Him, there is no hope. You can't save yourself. Whosoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And then He asks this question in 26 For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? He gained the whole world, he saved himself. But he lost his soul. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? And in that context, Jesus he makes that statement to his disciples. Those who are following him. And then he says in verse 27, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he will reward each according to his works. You have a sense that he is talking to his own people there when he says he is coming with his reward. He says, I shortly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. He's talking about the people of God. He's speaking about believers, those who are following the Lord Jesus Christ. And what an incentive and motivation for us to follow Christ. He is coming to reward us for what we did for him. Paul makes reference to this in his letter to the church in Corinth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 10, in, in light of this, Paul is talking about the resurrection and he goes into more details about this in 1 Corinthians 15, as well as his letter uh, to the church in Thessalonica, talking about the, the, the hope of glory that we have through Christ, that we are going to have glorified bodies. And he mentions there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done. Whether good or bad. He makes reference to this as well in Romans 14.10. Where he calls it the judgment seat of God. This is where believers stand before God. To give a personal account of how they live. And receive a reward from him, there are a di a different words used for judgment in the Greek, you know, in, 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 in uh, different instances. 
One, one sense it's, uh, uh, is to receive a reward, like when, w when one stands before a judge at the end of a race, an event, they give the person a reward. And on another sense, it's like when one stands you know, to be judged, you know, to be condemned. So you find uh, two, two different instances for that word judgment in the Greek. In 1 Corinthians 3.10, Paul uses the illustration of building materials to explain how the believer's works are like gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and straw. And they are rewarded depending on what they did. And he mentions there how that day, the day of Christ, when Christ uh, comes, how their works will be tested by fire on that day. Why fire? Because God is a consuming fire. Because the eyes of the Son of God are as fire. And everything we have done as Christians for Him will be tried and tested there. And we will receive our reward. The judgment seat of Christ, Bema, in Greek, is not for sins. We're not going to stand there condemned. It's not possible. Why? Because Christ hung condemned on the cross for our sake. He took the wrath of God on that cross. And if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have passed from judgment into light. We are saved on his own merit and his own credit. He accomplishes that for us. That's what he did for us. Our names are written in Lamb's book of life. And he gives us new life as we believe in him. And we become children of God. Having passed from death into life. But we will be rewarded based on what we did with the new life that he gave us. That is what it mentions in verses 14 to 15 of 1 Corinthians a tree it says if anyone's work which he has built if anyone's work which he has built on it on the foundation of Christ endures he will receive a reward if anyone's work is burned he will suffer loss but he himself will be saved yet so as he will be saved as through the fire <coughs> lost the works that he did, he wouldn't receive reward because they weren't satisfactory in the Lord's sight. And this is what he mentions in Matthew 19, 27, which we have read that when he comes in his glory with his angels, he will come to reward everyone according to what they've done for him. Christ is coming again. And his coming is imminent. In an hour when no one expects, as we heard this morning, he mentioned this severally in the Gospels. And we also find this in the Epistles. This is a key doctrine of the church, which we believe and hold on to. It's a very important aspect of the Gospel. The Lord's soon return. He is coming back in judgment. He saves you. What does He save you from? Is it just your sin? It's not just your sin. He also saves you as well from the wrath of God which is coming upon the world. As a believer in him, you're not going to be found in that number. Because you have believed in the Son of God who loved you and gave his life for you. The apostles, they wrote and lived with the urgency as if Christ was coming in their day. This is the reality. And that is why Christ exhorts us to be watchful. We keep watch by examining the lives that we live. Living wisely and being obedient to the Master's will. Faithfully using the talents and resources that He has given to us. We have to be prayerful as well. So that we can overcome the temptations of Satan and his deception. And be counted worthy to escape all the things that are coming upon the earth. And to stand before the Son of Man. Another thing we have to be doing in light of Christ's imminent return is not forsaking the gathering of ourselves together like the manner of some is. 
but meeting regularly to exhort and encourage each other in as much as we see the day approaching this day of judgment we come into the meetings we come into the house of God and it is, it is a privilege and a wonderful thing that we can still meet like this our brothers and sisters in the nations they don't have the opportunity to meet like this for them this type of meeting is really really precious because many times it's costing them their lives they're dying to meet like this but this is just the reality of the Christian life and we are to identify with our brothers and sisters who are suffering going through uh, persecution trials and tribulations we are to redeem the time looking for that blessed hope the appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ for God has not appointed us unto wrath but to receive salvation through his son Jesus Christ Christ delivers us from the wrath to come Paul writes all of these in his letter uh, to the Christian in Thessalonica Jesus mentioned in John 14 as we heard as well this morning in my father's house which is heaven are many dwelling places Amen. if it were not so I would have told you and then he says I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also what a promise for us from our dear Savior this is speaking about taking us to dwell with him forever in his father's kingdom never to be separated in that place where we will never grow old where sickness pain and sorrow is all taken away where we will never have to deal with the weakness of this body and sin ever again this is the reality of what Christ promises we think of family members who have gone on, who have died. We think about loved ones. And in the words of a, a poet, it says, Even for the dead, I will not bind my soul to grief. Death cannot long divide. For it is not, for is it not as though the rose that climbed my garden wall has blossomed on the other side? Death doth hide, but not divide. Thou art but on Christ's other side. Thou art with Christ, and Christ with me. In Christ united, still are we. What a hope we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. The family members who have died believing in Christ, they only went ahead of us. And through Christ, we will see them again it is only through christ that we have this hope of seeing family members again who died in him the imm imminency of christ's return means that it could break upon the world at any moment this is just the reality as well of his coming no one knows the day the time or the hour it could happen any time the twinkling of an eye even though there are mockers and scoffers now we are to live ready we are to live prepared expectant of the soon coming of our lord he will come again as scripture says are you prepared to meet him do you long for his appearing and are eagerly waiting for him is it your joy to meet him do you say with the Spirit, even so, come, Lord Jesus? Are you faithful and diligently serving Him, joyfully, where He has called you? Or like that wicked and lazy servant, you have buried the talent which He gave you? Are you walking out your salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. I want to conclude now by speaking to those in the other category who are yet to believe in the Son of God. 
those who are at ease in Zion, those who are content to live on the fence and walk the borders of the kingdom of God, but never entering in, those who are in church but not in Christ, those who reject Christ, those who are mouth professors but not heart possessors, those who have substituted belief in the Lord Jesus for religion, those who profess that they know God but in works deny Him, those who have a form of godliness but deny the power of God thereof, those who name the name of Christ but do not depart from iniquity, those who turn the grace of God into lewdness and godliness as a means of gain. Those with no fruit of repentance. Those who are wolves in sheep clothing. Those who are dogs returning to their own vomit. And pigs wallowing again in the mud after being washed. Those who haven't had their natures changed to that of the Lamb of God. The cowardly, the Bible says, the unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, whom the Bible calls the wicked, and says, will not inherit the kingdom of God, but will have their part in a lake with bones, with fire and brimstone. Jesus preached on hell more than he preached on heaven. These are two places that are literal. They are literal places which the scripture clearly reveals to us. These two places are realities we find in scriptures. Hell is real just as much as heaven is real. It is a place that Jesus said is prepared for the devil and his angels. It is a place of eternal punishment for the enemies of God. It is a place where their worms never die and the fire is not quenched. Where the smoke of their torment rises up forever and ever. Remember the rich man went there. He begged for Lazarus to be sent that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool his tongue. It is a place where surely God's goodness and mercy shall never follow you all the days of your life. It is a place where Psalm 9 mentions that the wicked are torn into and the nations that forget God. The atheists are there. The fools are are there. The proud and rebellious are there. The wicked are there. Judas is there. And as terrible as hell is, it is only a prison where the enemies of God are presently held for the day of judgment when they are thrown into the lake of fire. This is the final punishment of the wicked. Let us look at this awesome day of the great white throne judgment as we wrap up in Revelation chapter 20. This is the judgment of the ages. It is the tribunal of tribunals. We find it there in verse 11, from verse 11 of Revelation 20. It is a judgment at the end of the age when the eternal purpose of God is fulfilled and God brings in the new heaven and the new earth the mentions are there then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it the person who sits on this throne is none other than the Lord Jesus for God has committed all judgment to the Son the one by whom he created and governs the universe the one by whom he redeems his people and one day judges all of mankind in perfect righteousness. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords and judge of judges. 
Paul mentions in Acts 17 verse 31 that God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. This man is Jesus Christ who is almighty God. He sits on the throne um, before the face before his face the earth and the heaven they fled and there was found no place for them. So then I saw the dead small and great standing before God and books were opened. This is the judgment of all those who are not saved. The believers were judged at the Bema seat of Christ for their rewards. This judgment here is the judgment of condemnation. And that is why you find there that the books were open, plural. And another book, singular, was open, which is the book of life. See, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. All these dead here, they are judged according to their works by the things written in the books. It says the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead who were in them. This is the day of reckoning for all who rejected Christ's salvation. The death and hell here are personified, death being the reaper. Whether through plagues, wars, famine, natural disasters, it, here it yields up its harvest. And hell, which is the keeper, also yields up its prisoners. There is no way, nowhere to hide. And they are judged according to their works. Verse 14, then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Death and hell, they are relocated to the lake of fire. The first death is the physical death. Hebrews 9 says, It's appointed unto man wants to die, after which is the judgment. With the physical death, man's eternal destination and fate is sealed. That is, this judgment in, in death is a final verdict given. And there is no court of appeals after that. Their destination, where they are heading, is sealed in, in death. Hell is only an intermission for the wicked between death and the lake of fire. There is no coming out of hell once you land there. What qualifies one for hell and the lake of fire? Verse 15. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the defining decision. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? If you died now, it means Christ has come for you. Your fate has been sealed. You will go straight into eternity. But where will you appear? In heaven or in hell? May you hear the warning calls of the gospel through this doctrine of Christ's imminent return in judgment. And may you seek the Lord while he is near, forsaking your wicked ways and unrighteous thoughts and returning to the Lord for he is merciful. He will have compassion and freely pardon you. Amen. 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 Let us turn to seven five nine in our hymn books. Seven five nine. It's time to sing when the music begins.
when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. for this hope of glory that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ to spend eternity with you in your presence oh God never to be separated to know your goodness and mercy surely all the days of our lives without end to dwell in your house forever and ever Oh Lord, help us to rejoice in this knowledge. Let it inspire us and drive us, Lord, to be faithful where you have called us, to serve you wholeheartedly, to go out into the highways and byways to make you known, to give ourselves a prayer, fellowship, to be doing those things that you require of us even now before your soon coming. Lord, remember those who do not know you yet. They are not yet in this relationship that you provide through your sacrifice. This relationship with God. Lord, move on their hearts. They may be here this morning. Lord, touch them. Cause them to go home with his words they've heard this morning in their hearts, Lord. Pray that you remember us in our labors and all that we do for your kingdom, to bless it, grant fruits unto eternal life. So bless us on our way as we meet uh, to fellowship and to uh, share together. Bless our time, Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. And be gracious unto you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his perfect peace, his perfect shalom. Amen. 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 Thank you.